All right. So welcome everyone. My name is Alexandra Lecour. I'm the director of the European Cultural Academy here in Venice. I'm very excited to host this um, art webinar. We have an amazing um, list of uh, guests uh, today. And I see that we have uh, quite some people uh, joining us and we received a lot of emails um, with the request to share the uh, recording um, later for the ones who would like to uh, see it uh, later. I'm happy to introduce um, my colleague, uh, Maria Nikrasova. She's uh, also a co-founder of the Academy. Hi, Maria. Hello, ciao tutti. She is, um, Maria has created the course, which is called Venice Biennale Revealed. And she's one of the speakers of the course. And Maria also curated a lot of projects during the Venice Biennale, both during the Art Biennale and Architecture Biennale. Um, and um, she will share her point of view today on why this uh, show um, can uh, be a catalyst for your creative career, why it is important to visit uh, the event, and how it can help you. Also with me, I have Alexis Furter. Hi joining us from New York. Um, welcome. Um, Alexis and, um, is um, an amazing uh, consultant um, and uh, really expert in how to build your art career, how to uh, promote yourself online, how to find the right audience and communicate um, the topics that are very dear to your artistic uh, practice to audience, both online and offline. Uh, welcome. And um, it's very interesting because Alexis um, hasn't been to the Biennale yet, and she will join the, um, uh, the, the, uh, the Academy uh, this uh, summer. Um, so um, I'm, I would be very curious to know what are the expectations of the Biennale and um, why um, it is important to, for her to visit the event. And of course, with us, we have Steven Weinberg. Hi. 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 Where are you joining us from? Uh, from London today. He's, he's a jet setter. A little bit. <laughs> <laughs> from London. Okay, not that much time difference. Very much welcome. And Steven is an uh, artist. Um, he has done various projects with uh, the Academy and has followed, um, I think, uh, many of our uh, programs. And last year, he also been a speaker at the Academy and, of course, uh, did the project uh, during the Venice Biennale um, as well. And we are going to talk about female artists and, uh, in particular, the participation of the female artists in the Biennale um, uh, of 2023. And I thought it was important to invite Stephen to balance our conversation a little bit and see the um a different uh, uh point uh, of view and of course i'm i'm very interested to hear uh, about the projects that um you're working on uh, right now um including um nfts and uh digital uh art all right thank you um everyone of course welcome um we're going to have a dis we're going to start a discussion if you have any questions, you can put them in the chat section uh, at Zoom. And then later we uh, will have uh, some time dedicated to those questions. We'll go um, through them. If you are not muted yet, I uh, kindly ask you to do that. Um, so shall, um, shall we start, guys? What do you think? Sure. Let's do it. Let's do it. Um, I'm going to do a little introduction of the uh, Venice uh, Biennale uh, uh, of uh, 2023, uh, um, just to, to, to give you guys um, an idea of, uh, of what it is. I think everybody could see my screen, right? Yes. Yeah, okay. All right. So, uh, both art and architecture biennales are the oldest and the most prestigious show uh, shows in art and uh, architecture. And if you could guess from the uh, title of the Biennale, that means that one year it is art uh, edition and the next year it's an architecture edition. So normally we would have 
even uh, uh, years for architecture and uneven for art. But during COVID, the first time ever um, in the long history of the Venice uh, Biennale, um, that uh, particular uh, thing changed. So this year in 2023, we have an architecture Biennale that will open until, uh, in the end of um, May. It, here on the screen, you see the uh, logo of this Biennale, and it's kind of a deconstructed line. If uh, you are into abstract and you can imagine that, um, this is what it is. And the Biennale is called the Laboratory of the Future. It is 16th Architecture Biennale. Why it is particularly important um, and interesting for us and also why it is very special for female artists uh, and creatives and designers and architects because for the first time in the history of the Venice Biennale, the creative director, so the main person who is responsible for the project, but also uh, the person who selects, who is responsible for main uh, exhibition, central exhibition, the topic, the educational program and so on, is a um, uh, female uh, architect um, from the African continent. Uh, here she is. Her name is Leslie Loco. And uh, here uh, on the picture, she's with uh, Roberto Cicuto, who is the director of the Biennale Foundation. So she was the one who chose the topic, which is called the laboratory of the future. Why it's also why also this edition is very interesting is that it um, has an unprecedented number of female uh, artists and architects participating in the uh, main exhibition, but also in the national pavilions. So the national representations. Um, if uh, there is a project from France, a project from US, project from uh, Britain, and it has an unprecedented number of female participants, and uh, it is also very young. The average age is 40 years old, which is very young. Before that, um, Biennale, you know, participation in the Biennale uh, was kind of the pinnacle of your career. So we had um, all, the, all the artists um, and now they are inviting a lot of young talents scouting all over the world um, to, to, for the project to bring them to Venice for six months. So the Biennale lasts from the end of May till the end of uh, November. Uh, now, the Architecture Biennale is of course a very interesting addition. Um, it is very interdisciplinary. What does that mean? It actually means that um, it's not only architects participating because uh, the idea behind the show is that we all come together as creatives, artists, designers, biologists, urban planners, um, and uh, philosophers, writers, actors, and we uh, together try to solve the biggest challenges that our planet, that our society has right now. And the project on these challenges are presented in Venice for six months. So I've been to uh, many Biennales uh, during my time at uh, the European Cultural Academy. And I could say that when you walk in Arsenale or Giardini, which are the main locations for the show, it's very difficult to say whether uh, it's an art exhibition or architecture exhibition, because it's really about the ideas and the uh, interdisciplinary collaboration really shows in the project. Um, so here I just uh, gave you very quickly, you know, some examples of what we can expect uh, from the national project. For example, here's um, the team which is working on the British Pavilion and they have a very romantic <laughs> um, topic for, for their project, which is called uh, Dancing uh, Before uh, the Moon. And the exhibition promotes the idea that everyday rituals like growing food and cooking uh, to uh, playing games and dancing are tools oh, for community. But uh, guys, if you are not muted yet, can I ask you to 
Can I ask you to mute? Thank you. So the British Pavilion um, uh, is dedicated to rituals and the ev that everyday rituals are uh, tools for communities to establish spaces and present new ways of thinking about art, architecture, and the built environment. Okay. We have very interesting uh, French pavilion, and I think that could, you know, it, that could win potentially the Venice Biennale of uh, this year. Um, uh, it consists of this kind of Miro uh, spheres. It's called the uh, Ball Theater, La Fête n'est pas finie. And um, it actually responds to the topic of that suggested uh, by, that was suggested by uh, Leslie Loco, the liberator of the future. And uh, what a uh, French uh, team tries to imagine is how can we imagine a uh, future for us and for our yes, planet? Yes, and uh, yes. would it be uh, you know, completely uh, robotic and artificial? Or is there hope that uh, we will uh, save our planet? And if, if there is a hope, so how, how would that look like? So you see that those projects, you, you know, they do not resemble uh, white uh, cube uh, technical architecture models or structures. They're very uh, dynamic and um, uh, very artistic, very interdisciplinary. And this is just to give you an idea of uh, how uh, the architecture Biennale would look like, and also tell you about the uh, participants um, and why it is important uh, for female artists, architects, designers, and creators to be there. Um, and now I would like to, to start our discussion and also to give the floor to, to the guests, to Maria, uh, to Alexis, to Steven, right? So, um, Maria, what do you think about the current um, or the coming edition um, of the Biennale as a way for a creative to um, uh, develop further the creative process or how it, visiting the Biennale could actually help your career as an artist? Sure. Um, I can't be more excited. To tell you the truth, the truth about the current edition, um, for two things. Uh, for me, there are mainly two reasons to come to the Biennale. The first is to find yourself. I remember the first time I went, and it was an Aravena project. I explored the Biennale for three hours, and then I sat down and I couldn't talk for two because I had so many. Um, ideas, I had so many thoughts, it, it gave me so much food for reflection. So for me, Biennale is always going and finding the topic to which you can connect and finding yourself as a creative person within this incredible scope of themes. And then the second, I couldn't, uh, reason to come to the Biennale, I couldn't really um, point it out myself, but then I talked to Daniel Krisa, who is an amazing art blogger and curator and the artist. And she came and she said, you know, Maria, I've done all my life the art that was very small, that you could put on the palm of your head, of your hand. And then I came to the Biennale and it was the first time when I saw women making art projects so big that I couldn't even believe it. And it's true. We had Sheila Hicks there and she created a wall. That was her project, a giant a wall made of giant soft balls of very bright colors. Um, so she said it was the first time when I realized I can do something because it was the first time that I saw projects of that dimension. So the Binali for me is about finding yourself within the topics that are presented there, the ideas, and also inspiration, but also ambition, right? Inspiration in the sense of ambition. It makes you imagine things that you can do, even if inside you might be not ready for them. So I'm very excited. I think that uh, Leslie Loco did an excellent job from the press conference that uh, uh, I've attended from the project that I have seen. There is a lot of pressure on her uh, being in that role. And I think that she made the right choice to um, go with female artists and to go with emerging artists. So we'll see. 
So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, thank you, Marie. It's very interesting. Steven, how was it for you to visit your first Biennale? What were your expectations and what were your first uh, impressions as an artist? Okay, thank you, uh, Alex. Um, look, for everybody wondering why I'm on the call, uh, the reason <laughs> is that uh, I have a, a, a art practice, a digital art practice, uh, specialising in AR, particularly on garments, where there's an, AR, an image which comes alive with a QR code. Um, I uh, had an exhibition uh, last year at Soho House in Barcelona. Um, my reels to do with art projects that 13 million views in the last couple of months. And so what? Well, the so what is that three years ago, none of that existed. Mm -hmm. And uh, the three years ago, uh, I came to Venice to, to do this course about the uh, Biennale. It was the worst flooding for three, uh, 60 years in Venice. Um, it was a difficult time to, leave, to get away from work, to, to, do, to go to Venice. But it was, uh, a, you know, without a word of a cliche, a life-changing experience, really. And I think, um, you know, to, uh, to phrase that's been used already, to, to find yourself, for sure, to be inspired, but also the people you meet. That's the big deal, I think. Uh, the people, the curators of the different uh, collections within the Biennale who you get access through the course, but also the fellow um, course members uh, to provide you know, a little community of, of encouragement and uh, some inspiration as well. So it's, uh, that's uh, my thing about the Biennale that I had been before, for sure, many times uh, as a visitor, but to do it in a curated way uh, through the people with the ECA made a huge difference. So that's really the reason. Thank you, Stephen. So you visited the Art Biennale, which was curated by Ralph uh, Rugoff. Uh, and it had a very interesting uh, title, which was called May You uh, Live in Interesting uh, Times. That was a fake uh, Chinese proverb. Um, and uh, no, you know, we, we don't wish that you would live in interesting times. Um, and I think that was one of the most successful art biennales that attracted a lot of uh, visitors. Usually the biennale, the art biennale attracts around half a million visitors. Last year it was 600, uh, uh, 650,000. And this year we do expect uh, at least half a million visitors for um for the for the architecture biennale with uh leslie uh loco so uh, yeah i have to actually a, a comment on that i think that Stephen he made a very you made a very valid point one tough thing about biennale is that it is huge right mm -hmm. so 89 national representations plus the central pavilion plus many projects in the parallel program, plus what it's called the uh, satellite events or independent events. So there are about 200, 300 events, exhibitions, talks, workshops happening at the same time in Venice, because of course it is a magnet. And it is very good because a lot of people are there. So it's a great opportunity to connect, to network, or to see art from the countries that you've never seen before right, uh, and have little opportunities to, to see anywhere. But at the same time, it is challenging to understand uh, the quality of the projects and the ones that will be worth visiting and worth your attention. Yeah, so and that's very interesting because there's so many projects, the quality differs. Uh, you would expect that, uh, you know, if you are at the Venice Biennale, that, that it's really cutting edge top level art, but it is not always uh, the case just because of the amount of projects that, that need to be in and, and need to be there. And it, indeed they vary by topics, but for this year, we do think that, you know, we can already kind of have some main major themes um, that we can expect to see at the show. Of course, uh, there is a big uh, focus on Africa and um, a lot of the artists, they uh, come from the African content, continent or uh, they are um, a part of Africa diaspora all over the world. Of course, there is a big focus on sustainability and how to solve uh, climate change uh, issues. And then there is a very, another topic is uh, female empowerment. And, um, you know, with the idea that maybe it will help to make the world better if there are more women in charge. 
So these three things we can uh, already uh, see through the project, but of course you have projects covering every, everything uh, from uh, uh, you know uh, innovation, um, uh, family rituals, um, uh, digital uh, challenges, and so on. What I'm curious to see if there would be more digital projects or projects with AR and VR things like this. During the last Biennale in 2022, curated by Cecilia Alemani, an Italian curator, there were very, very few uh, projects with digital art. Um, you know, it was a very old school physical Biennale with sculptures, paintings, and uh, photographs. So it's very interesting to see if there would be a change um, this time. Um, Alexis, so I'm very curious to to hear about your expectations of um, what to see, what, what you would see in Venice and uh, your expectations about this uh, Biennale. Oh, well, I mean, well, first of all, thank you so much again for having me here. It's such an honor to be here in every way. I'm so happy to know about um, ECA and just to be a part of this and to be able to invite my community to be a part of this because there's so much alignment in not only what ECA stands for, but the whole theme of the Venice Biennale for this year. So I feel like it's the perfect time for me to be um, to be attending for the first time. It's, it's very mm -hmm. exciting. Um, my expectations, I mean, you know, I, I know so much about the because so, so many of the artists in, in my community, my artists and business community, have been a part of the, uh, the Biennale, either as, as part of a satellite or parallel uh, program. So I've learned so much about it, you know, um, from that standpoint, um, as well as other artists, you know, I know who've been part, part of the actual um, event and architects as well. I've known a lot of architects who've been part of it. Um, my expectation is just total immersion and to be able to share this newer experience with this feminine, you know, this theme with our whole community. So basically the, the theme of artists in business is um, to really focus on artists who are creating art for, um, for deeper, more specific reasons um, to make an impact in the world in specific ways. And that's what we really hone in on. So it's like the the heroes, like the 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 famous artists in our community are the ones who are working in their communities, you know, mothers, um, grandmothers, um, women and so and men as well, who are creating art as a result of something that has happened in their lives and their, you know, their aim is to make an impact. And we love to really illuminate that and bring that forward and help them create a business around that. So um, it takes a lot of courage to do that. And it takes a lot of understanding of, you know, why you're doing what you're doing and the motivation to really grow a business in the right way. So bringing those two together is, is the real sweet spot, you know, that where we help artists. And so this whole uh, Biennale theme really speaks to that as well. So yeah. very excited. And so many of the artists, some of the artists here, I see Siglinda is here and I see a couple of other people who I believe are, are actually going. So um, really just looking forward to being with them in person. Yeah. It, it, it's really exciting in, uh, indeed, and we have a lot of artists coming to Venice during the, the Biennale, and I do notice that um, there are two things that really helps to um, come back a bit to yourself and why actually you decide, remember why actually you decided to be an artist. Um, first of all, when you see a lot of projects um, with very different mediums, you actually get kind of inspired you know we have artists coming and they've been doing paintings or collage before and then they see something on that the same subject but in a completely different medium it could be digital but it could also be sculpture or even performance and then you see oh actually I also want to do that so that's one thing and then um, the second thing is that of course if you, you know because there are a lot of projects for sure, there would be artists or architects 
working on the same subject that you are working. So uh, seeing that these projects having a different perspective, uh, how they tell these stories, uh, what is their angle is also very enriching and quite, uh, quite um, interesting. Well, I think that can lead to exciting collaboration. Sorry, Alexis. I think that once you meet people, then this is where the magic happens because you meet people that work on the same subjects, but there would be no other way for you to connect. Mm -hmm. um, and then later uh, you come back and say, hey, let's do something together. Or I think that I have something interesting to propose. And then then it goes. Yeah, Maria, that's so interesting because I wrote down actually what you said, which was find yourself, your inspiration, your ideas. And um, yeah, to do, to be able to do that in person and not, you know, and also to understand personally for me, um, to understand that there are others who are, could be working on the exact same concept or theme or type of idea that you are, but you are going to do, you're going to produce yours in the most unique way and that is what actually eliminates competition, especially when we're thinking about business, especially when we're thinking about, is there space for me? Do I need to you know, alter what I'm doing? And the answer is no. You just need to bring forward more what um, makes this unique for you. And, um, and, and I feel like that comes to life too when, when we come together in person. Yeah, and I also think this abundance of art because you know we had some some participants that uh, uh, compared compared time in Venice with an intellectual pie eating contest contest because there's so much art going on and you eat like you get in and you just need to digest it. You understand that there is enough space in the art world for everyone, and there is enough customers for you and audience that will appreciate your art and will love your art it's really you know there are a lot of people doing things but it's there is enough space for everyone and I think it's very also true for for Stephen as well that he he also was able to to find the, the community and the audience who appreciate art and uh, you know a very new form of art digital AR you're busy with NFTs and so on right that's right. And um, yeah, look, yeah, sort of um, flashbacks to uh, the Biennale, really. I think that is uh, a couple of those observations are pretty true that um, there's an overwhelming amount of stuff there. And you can walk past it too without really knowing the backstory. And then having someone uh, accompanying you who can uh, explain all that, that adds to the depth of uh, meaning. Mm -hmm. The other part, I think, is that uh, you do the connections you meet. You know, the people you meet um, uh, as curators of the different events um, and the people you meet on the course. And, and I guess the other observation is that the uh, although the BN official Biennale is a big show, for sure, there are a zillion other uh, satellite events around, uh, including which one I participated in, uh, which was the um, in the Giardini Marina Ressa, which was a, a sculpture that we uh, put in put in there for the architecture and the Anali. You know, I look, I just uh, being the sort of token male, I suppose I should make a couple of comments. One, I was interested to, um, uh, you know, this lady, uh, uh, Jerry Kardashian, the uh, the, the humorous, uh, well, polemist, polemicist, I guess you'd say, of the art world who makes these um, uh, observations of the uh, folly of the art world, I guess. But uh, one of the things I saw her speak where she said that uh, having done the Master of Fine Arts, there was a lot of attention on um, social criticism and structure and all that sort of stuff, but there wasn't much on negotiation. And she made the comment that uh, for cultural and uh, you know, um, uh, other reasons, you know, a lot of women don't get a, a fair deal when they come time to negotiate and sometimes sell themselves a bit short uh, in terms of extracting value for their work. And I yeah. think, uh, how do you overcome that? I think part of that is to have a supportive group around you. And uh, mm -hmm. certainly, you know, a, a byproduct of the uh, of uh, attending something like the Biennale and meeting and forming a bit of a community is to have a bit of a support group to help uh, develop your own career. Yeah. I agree. And you see, you know, in terms of female artists, of course, uh, you could also see it in the auctions that there is much more interest with um, uh, uh, in terms of uh, sales 
uh, for um, female artists. And also we, we kind of um, start adding more to the art history. And that was Alimani, the previous curator, did um, with the uh, Biennale of 2022. She had these time capsules that were showing works from female artists who actually impacted the art history, um, 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 how you say it, in as much as uh, Max Ernst, as Dali, um, but, you know, because they were females at that time, their names were kind of forgotten. And she created these time capsules to make sure that their names are also in the history of the Biennale. So 100 years later, <laughs> they've participated in the Venice Biennale in that way. And I think Leslie Loco, in that sense, uh, continues this tradition. And she, uh, you know, I was at the, the press conference um, when she presented uh, uh, the Liberator of the Future, and she said, you know, our goal is not to rewrite the, the, the art and architecture history, but to make it complete, to enrich it. And I think this is very interesting uh, to see because it will change the way we look at the past. It will change the way we, we um, understand the, uh, the art history or the, the architecture, the space. Um, and it's very exciting and I'm very happy that um, it's finally, you know, becoming such an important topic and that events, such prestigious big events like Biennale address that. Um, Alexis, you tell us, so do you mainly work uh, with a female artist or do you, what, what is the ratio like 50, 50, 70, 30, what is the ratio? <laughs> I mean, this is not, this is not um, by, uh by design, but it's you, it's really 90% women and about 10% men that we end up working with. Um, and, the, and again, that's not intentional. It's just, um, it's just the way it, you know, it panned out for us. Um, and I've thought a lot about this. And I think one of the main reasons that that is the case is because we focus so much on um, storytelling as a way to create a business combined with um, understanding to Stephen, to your point, which I think is so important, is to understand the business side of of, of this whole, mm -hmm. you know, this whole situation. So the way in which we approach a revenue plan for for creating a business, and the way in which we work in looking at that, like what you're creating from that perspective without compromising anything, I think really speaks to women because it is like the, it's it's often a, a gap that needs to be bridged in our own vocabulary. So um, yeah, I mean, just my own background in business, um, you know, I, I've, I've often been the only woman who has that 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 know how just because I sought it out and it was so important to me early on, but um, you know when I'm working with women now, women who are in their 70s, we've worked with who um, have helped their husbands grow businesses, like they've been the right hand for their entire lives and they've raised families, and at the same time they became these master artists, like in the style of the old Dutch masters, just masters, and now. They just want to learn how to do this for themselves. They don't need the money necessary. It's not about that. You know, they want, but they want to make streams of revenue on their own and learn how to do that, learn how to negotiate, learn how to create a revenue plan. So um, yeah, that's that's been the situation. I, I also wanted to say one quick thing about the digital world and NFTs and how that um, just the blockchain in general, what we're moving towards, how that is affecting buying behavior and how it is going to continue to affect buying behavior on and offline. So I think it's very important for all of us to understand just a bird's eye view of what that is, what that looks like um, conceptually, just on principle, so we can see like how how buying behavior is changing and um, yeah, how NFTs and the blockchain are going to continue to affect that. So we work that in as well. 
I, Alex, just uh, just on that point, I was in fact in uh, New York last week for uh, NFT NYC, which is the big uh, conference there. And it's interesting, probably about half of it was on commerce in terms of application of uh, blockchain technology or smart contracts, uh, particularly in the fashion side, yeah. But mm -hmm. uh, the other half was about uh, art. And some of the things now are, are really quite incredible. And uh, I expect that... Uh, you know, uh, they're, they're certainly at the Architecture Biennale a couple of years ago, the Canadian pavilion was literally a blank black canvas, but you scanned a code and then you saw the uh, image of the building uh, in front of you. So uh, that's uh, you know an early sort of start in that front. But yeah, I certainly think the um, the digital side uh, will uh, will you know. Uh, will continue to grow and you know, art is not just about oils and watercolors and things it's um, about other forms of uh, creativity as well yeah yeah I would like to circle back a little bit because I have a, a comment about the business uh, business side of things I think that one thing that um, I learned when I started working with projects in Venice and with the Biennale is that you can get more ambitious um, the if we're talking about national pavilion, the usual budget is one million euros, and the government. So if you say U.S., France, big countries, U.K., one million euros, and the government usually gives between two hundred fifty and two hundred eighty thousand. So how do you get seven hundred fifty thousand as a woman, as a female artist? And when you see these kind of questions, then um, it kind of grows your ambition, right? And then you learn things. There are projects in Venice that I've seen that had uh, another small budget, for example, 50,000 euros. Great national pavilions, great projects, all done through very creative ways, not out of gallery money or, you know, um, uh, typical traditional uh, funding. So one thing that I learned in Venice, you come with ambitious projects and you learn how to find money for these ambitious projects. And it kind of expands, you know, the possibilities of what you can do. Um, it's not an easy task. Um, it requires a lot of knowledge and persistence and uh, courage, I would say, uh, but uh, definitely, definitely worth trying. Yeah. And, and during those years, we've seen many different um, examples. For example, um, Grenada Pavilion, uh, they um, were promised uh, funding from um, their uh, government. So if we talk about National Pavilion, guys, uh, it means that it's uh, the country would like to represent the best artist or the most the artists they consider the most interesting at the Venice Biennale. So when you come to the show, you have individual artists uh, participating in the exhibition, but you also have artists that are representing France, representing Britain, representing uh, Australia, US, and so on. So we then we talk about national pavilions or national uh, participation, and that's usually done um, with the help of a uh, 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 ministry of tourism or ministry of culture, or ministry of foreign affairs. So for with the example of, and, and also funded by those um, uh, countries, but the budget as Marie mentioned could, could not, sometimes couldn't be enough. And uh, we had, um, uh, we talked to people from the Grenada Pavilion and they were promised uh, the funding for their project. It was done, but uh, they didn't receive the funding. And they started a, a fund me, go fund me campaign. Uh, and they uh, were able to collect uh, enough of money to, to make a wonderful, very interesting uh, pavilion at the Venice Biennale and have it for six months um, in Venice. Um, we have uh, artists who are extremely innovative. They say, you know, I participate in the Biennale, but I already sell my works before the exhibition. So to, to make sure that I have money to organize the project, because of course, once you are in Venice and once you exhibit in Venice, then uh, you know the price of your uh, uh, art goes up. So you know, they, they'd say, I create special works, I will sell it to you now, and then you already get a good deal because after six months, the price of the work will go up. So there are a lot of different ways. We also discuss it uh, during the course, of course, how to do it from sponsorships to, to, to uh, different fundraising uh, opportunities, uh, events, um, and so on. But it, indeed, it's um, it, 
a lot of things are possible and they're very creative ways to make uh, projects uh, come true for sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, all right. Um, uh, guys, I also, I have one question for Steven, but if you have any questions, please uh, send them in chat and we will be very happy to um, answer them. So Steven, for you, you mentioned the um, NFT. And so tell, tell us um, this opportunity um, and in terms of finding your audience and the audience for your art. Do you think that you 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 have now um, more exposure because you are into digital art? So you you know the, you have the eyeballs from people from all over the world, yeah. or you think you know, it, or it, would it be different if it was if you continued creating sculptures? How is that? How was that transition for you from physical to digital, from sculpture to to digital art and NFTs? Yeah, well, it's it's an interesting point, isn't it? You know, that um, uh, in one sense, we live at the greatest time ever for opportunities within art, that uh, people don't need to go through the old path of exhibiting at the local fate or something, then getting a local gallery, then one day hopefully working their way up to uh, Christie's or Gargason or something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, you can uh, distribute your art straight away through... Um, uh, you know, through these different platforms and indeed contact, you know, a, a literally millions of people if if they're, if they it uh, picks up, you know, um, volume where people start liking it and then the algorithm gets hold of it and away you go. Like I've had uh, something like, I've only got 500 followers, what that's worth on Instagram, but uh, most recently 13,000 likes for um, uh, one of my one of my pieces. So I think uh, that's the good news. The bad news is that there's uh, it's never been more competitive. That uh, yeah. uh, and you know and for, uh, if you go to a lot of art shows, you do see a surprising amount of work that is essentially derivative or um, or decorative. And I think it's really important coming back back to finding your voice. I, I, I say that I think I think to be to give this a go, you need three things. You need uh, one. You need to have a, an idea something that's a bit unique for sure. You need to have a bit of a supportive framework to um, whether that's one person or a partner or indeed a group of people that you can achieve now through a digital community. And the third thing is you're going to do a bit of drive. Uh, there's no point saying, oh, look, I, I could do art, but um, you know, I haven't had the opportunity or uh, I could have got to that exhibition, but I, I put the apl application was too late. Maybe I'll do it next time, blah, blah, blah. There's a million reasons not to do things. There's only you know, so only one good reason to do it. So you need to have that bit of a, an idea. You know, I wouldn't say talent, but certainly an idea. You need to have uh, you know, a supportive environment around you, and you need a bit of drive to to make it happen. And you know, back, why go to the Biennale? I think at the very least you can see people and meet people leading parallel lives. Uh, you know, back to uh, Alexis's point, you don't don't need to sort of copy what each other are doing. But, you know, there is a bit of inspiration in seeing that other people are going through the same uh, challenges and self-doubt and all that sort of thing. And, um, uh, hey, what a great place to get inspired to in Venice. But, yeah. uh, you know, I think that's, uh, you know, uh, that journey, that's a bit of a cliche these days, the journey people need to go on, uh, this could be a bit of a, a catalyst for that yeah yeah true i i want to make this comment i think that uh the, the first time i visited a binale somebody said don't worry if it's bad even if it's bad it's still venice you know and i think that it's completely true um venice is an incredible space of course for to explore art to get uh, um, to get inspired to see the best of the best uh, from the art history. It has a quite a strange angle if you do a curatorial project in the Venetian Palazzo. I've talked to many artists who said, if I do a project in a palazzo that has a view on the Grand Canal, I want all the windows closed because I don't want my art to compete with the view on the Grand Canal. Or for example, you do it in the Venetian Palazzo and you say, I want to build fake walls and create a white cube space because I don't want my art to compete with a grandeur of Venetian Palazzo. So there are challenges <laughs> there. 
and we don't start with crooked uh, floors and, uh, and, and walls, of course, let's not go there. But in general, I think um, Venice is an incredible space. I had this quote uh, some time ago um, that I thought was uh, was very true. It says, artists, they have two mothers and one of them is Italy. Um, so I think that, I mean, if you need um, inspiration, if you've ever started art history, you need to see uh, everything that is there and come to Venice. Um, if it's if the Biennale is good, great. If the Biennale is bad, you're in Venice. And then Aperol Spritz is always there. <laughs> We actually have a question from Ani. Who are the primary patrons of art? In other words, who buys- Sorry, art? I made a comment. There is somebody in the chat who reached out to me and he said, if you want to um, uh, put on your camera, put on your video, please do. We're in a very friendly atmosphere here. So we can also stay connected. Yeah. Mm, thank you, Maria. So the question is who, who buys art uh, that is shown at the Biennale and why? Is it an investment and so on? So it's a thank you for a question, very interesting question. Um, there is an internal saying here in Venice, um, see it in Venice, uh, buy it in Basel, meaning that you see the work that is presented at the Venice Biennale. Usually the Biennale opens in May. And then all the international art crowd that came for the opening in June meets at Art Basel, which is a big art fair. If you, so, Art Biennale is a show; you cannot purchase anything there. Um, and but uh, Art Basel is a fair, so you can actually go and purchase art. Uh um, and um, uh, the uh, uh, the you know this saying is very true. A lot of people see it in Venice and they buy it as an investment in, um, in, in Basel. But um, there are also art presented from the museums and not only from the galleries, which is not from sa for sale. Um, some of the works are created specially uh, for the show and then um, there are plans to show them on, uh, in other locations, other countries and um, other cities. So it's, um, um, uh, you know, it's, it, 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 it depends. Um, what I could also say, and that's, that's interesting because, you know, this year Biennale, I mentioned that it's very young and before we had kind of established artists presented at the Biennale. Um, it's, I think it's great that Biennale shows a lot of young talent. Um, but sometimes um, the projects are also supported or sponsored by galleries just because there is not enough state budget to do it. And then we are, we can wonder uh, whether gallery has some influence on who is uh, presented at the Viennese Biennale. Officially, they're not, but they do sponsor the project. So um, the fact that there are more young artists that have a long career <laughs> in front of them, you know, you might think that maybe the galleries are interested in, in showing young artists rather than established ones, because we know that the price would go up after six months exhibiting in Venice. Uh, indeed, there you, if Annie is based in Miami, there's also Basel. So uh, Basel is an international art fair. There is Art Basel uh, in Switzerland, in Basel. There is in June, there is Art Basel in uh, Miami, which takes place at the end of December, which actually caters to American uh, collectors. There is Art Basel Hong Kong. Um, for the Asian uh, collectors. So they're developing uh, quite uh, well. And I think, wh where is their opening? Maybe Maria knows, I think in LA, no, somewhere else. They're opening uh, for the collectors over there. So it is an international uh, fair that takes place throughout the year in different uh, countries. Lace Fries, Alexandra. Oh yeah, Lace Fries, sorry, yeah. Uh, to, uh, to to you know to to get access to collectors from different parts uh, of the world. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Well, just to sum up, in the Biennale, you cannot buy art, but it doesn't mean you can buy you cannot buy before or after, um, or have some deals made. Just not. 
officially. And of course, there are great galleries in Venice that organize projects specifically for the uh, uh, for the Biennale period. Um, and um, they usually have a showing um, from May till November, just to make sure that the collectors are there and they see the works. Yeah. And also, if we talk about it, it's very interesting if to, to meet those people in Venice, because Venice um, is um, a city where you uh, cannot uh, drive a car. Uh, you know, you have to walk the streets because of the canals, so there are no cars in the city. That means it doesn't matter whether you arrived uh, by a super yacht on your private jet um, or you came by train uh, backpacking, you all walk the same streets and you all go to the Biennale and to the art galleries. Um, so I talked to um, a gallery owner in Venice, which also they also have a representation in New York, and they say in New York, we only sell by appointment. So you have to make an appointment to enter the gallery and to, to look at art. And in Venice, 70% of their sales is done uh, with walk-ins. So people are just passing it, liking it, and uh, uh, and buying it. So in that sense, it's a big melting pot. And it's very interesting because you, you know, it's it's a rather small city. The city center is also quite small. So uh there are a lot of suddenly there are a lot of different people, but all uh walking the same uh, streets. I wanted to just mention one thing about this topic of partnerships, which is what I'm how I would characterize it. Like, you know, <clears throat> how do you cre create um, partnerships, or how do you how do you figure out who your your bigger investors could be? And um, one thing I think is so powerful is to understand how that works and how you can make that happen for yourself as an, an artist in business. I mean, that's one thing that um, we'll be focusing on in the. Um, during the 10 days of the workshop, at least in, in the section that, that I'll be, I'll be yeah. teaching. Um, and, and that's such a powerful skill set to have, how to understand what different, not just galleries, but businesses and um, entities and influencers, um, people with audiences that are your audience as well, but you offer something complimentary. So you can form partnerships where they, you know, they share your work willingly and it's a win-win-win situation for everybody involved. So understanding how to do that really, I think, um, allows you to relax more in this situation and expand, open your mind to all the possibilities around you at the BNLA because you can be searching for the right partners with, with that, you know, with that knowledge um, in mind and um, yeah, and form really great ones. That's, that's what I feel. Yeah, I think it's a great, I think it's a great point. And this is why the program is open, not only to artists, but with, uh, for people with various backgrounds. So usually in one group, we have uh, artists, art collectors, um, art consultants, gallerists, uh, even some students. And what happens is that when they meet each other, they see that their skills, their knowledge, their network complement each other, and they can create beautiful projects. And they can really add value with the knowledge and skills they have and it you know it doesn't need to be an artistic value but you know we have people who can organize projects that could uh, do fundraising who we have galleries at the course that can provide their space or uh, connect to the artists and then later bring them to the art fairs and that's really interesting. Um, and for for Venice, I think it really works on the international level because there's so many people from all over the world that come to to see the projects and museums um, there. Yeah. I mean, look at Stephen. He comes from the finance world, right? I mean, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's a funny thing. I, I I come from the finance world. That's for sure. And uh, also as a uh, an art historian, I guess. Uh, and I sort of came to the course, uh, I was interested in the, I was particularly interested in the intersection of art and commerce, because typically uh, artistic people aren't very commercial and uh, commercial uh, people haven't got an artistic bone in their body sort of thing. So I think people who can straddle that nexus are, um, are pretty interesting. 
And I sort of came to this course because um, all the other things I looked at were uh, too time intensive, if, if you know what I mean. They required a big commitment of time to do a, a Masters of Cultural Studies or uh, a good course offered by the um, Royal Academy uh, here in London. And uh, anyway, so I sort of stumbled on this um, uh, the, the Biennale revealed. And I thought, oh, it's one. It was one week at that stage, and I thought, oh, yeah, well, ten days effectively. That oh, well, I can take that time off. And as I say, there was the uh, you know worst flooding for sixty years, and a lot you know was uh, a lot of reasons not to go. In fact, uh, when I arrived at the airport, um, none of the water taxis or anything were working because it's too dangerous to um, uh, to drive during the night. If you hit if hit a log or anything, the the taxi would sink. So, you sort of, so it's quite a, a struggle to get there, but uh, I'm glad I went. And as I say, the um, uh, the, you know, the 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 inspiration, I guess, but also the um, the connections. That's the other part I'd, I'd stress of uh, meeting people from disparate backgrounds, but with a sort of common interests, surprisingly common interests, and the opportunity to collaborate with them. In fact, uh, on the the contemporary art course that the ECA runs as well, which I ended up doing after the Biennale course. Uh, one of the guys I worked with on that and just was exhibiting at the uh, Dubai Art Fair, Stefan, you know, from, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Stefan Johnson. So, uh, and he, I, I think he'd say too that it's sort of um, uh, going to Venice, you know, kick-started, you know, he'd been mucking around a bit with things, but uh, going there sort of said, you know what, uh, and looking what other people are doing, I think I'll give this a go. Yeah, and, uh, that's that's really what it's about. Yeah, and also, yeah, becoming very practical. Okay, step by step, you can make these projects happen. And it's important just to to do something and not not to wait too long. Um, and wherever circumstances, because I guys with Stephen, I just tell you. So we we worked on contemporary art course. The idea was to create an art project. We made a sculpture together, a huge sculpture together. And we're supposed to bring it to Burning Man, and then uh, in uh, then COVID hit, so there was no um, uh, event in the in the desert, uh, uh, and so we. Uh, made a deal with a Giardini delle Marinare, so with a, a public uh, park, a sculpture park, to bring this big sculpture uh, to uh, to Venice. And during COVID time, so Stephen and uh, you know the other the other person he mentioned from Art Dubai, they were we were working together on that project uh, during the course um, during COVID. Uh, yeah, in fact, we, we we did it all uh, collaboratively, I guess, um, uh, via Zoom. In fact, for most of it. Yeah. Uh, but the practical part of uh, getting the, I des ended up designing and manufacturing the uh, the shell. It was if you go to my Instagram page and see that it was two meters high, and to get yeah. it, I, I, as um, Alex was saying, there's no cars in Venice, so to get anything delivered or installed is a massive job. Uh, that's for sure particularly in an environment where the uh, ships weren't sailing or were sailing to different destinations. And even the travel to Venice, I had to spend two weeks quarantine in Greece. You could do worse places to do quarantine. But, uh, yeah, there was sort of a bit of a bit of a story. But, you know, out of that, uh, Andrew Johnston, uh, who uh, you mentioned Burning Man, he's the guy who makes the man for Burning Man, if, if you know what I mean. And I've become good friends with him. And I, was, I visited him last week, a week in uh, San Francisco, talk about taking the shell uh, to Burning Man, finally, a, a re reimagined version of the shell using AR. So that, once again, that's another um, serendipitous relationship, <laughs> which really came about uh, unexpectedly through uh, involvement in the course. Yeah, Stephen, could you maybe share your Instagram account in the chat? Uh, so if, if people uh, would like to connect. Yeah, with if it, it's pretty straightforward. Stephen Weinberg. Yeah, so. great. <laughs> uh, great. So the, what a, it's so it's interesting that, you know, the project that you, you the idea for a project that you have, you might come with one idea to Venice, but then you you can rework it and it could become something else. And it's okay, and it will take more time, maybe that you you wanted to, but in the end, it's important to do it to take those steps, and then uh, and then then you you add that project to to the portfolio. Okay, guys, um, 
I see that people are sharing their contacts. Contacts. I think it's a great idea. If you have an Instagram account, you have a Facebook account or a website, please feel free to share it in the chat so everyone uh, will connect. Um, we've been talking for slightly more than an hour. Um, and um, so, you know, if we have, if, if there is one question that we are able to, please, please uh, put that in the chat, we'll be to answer one more question. Um, but um, otherwise, um, I think we should uh, wrap up. Um, I would like to uh, thank Alexis and Steven, and uh, we will meet them in uh, Venice uh, this summer. Um, for um, uh, you guys who are planning to visit uh, Venice Biennale this year uh, or doubting about it, please do, because it's going to be a very interesting event with a lot of uh, participations from uh, women, uh, female artists and um, architects, uh, really addressing uh, global challenges and, and uh, covering a lot of uh, relevant topics. Um, so I think it's important to, 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 to be exposed to something like this um, uh, to, and that, that would help you to um, understand yourself better, understand your creative process uh, better. Um, we're going to share the recording of this uh, webinar by email, and we also have a little surprise a uh, good surprise for everyone who uh, attended. Uh, we're going to send a promo code to join the course if you would like to join the uh, course uh, with us. Um, final words from Maria and Alexis. Maria? Yes, thank you very much for attending. I'm looking forward to see you all in Venice. If you want to understand a little bit more about yourself, come to the Biennale. You'll see the topics, you'll understand um, what you what topics you're attracted to. If you want to be more ambitious with your art, come to the Biennale. You'll get to see the art that you'll never even imagine existed, and it will take your artistic practice to new artistic practice to new heights. Um, if you have any questions about um, funding or projects or anything like this, just connect me. Connect with me at uh, Maria art. I'm happy to give you recommendations about Venice or if you want to do a project there, where to start. I'm very, we're very open. We, you know, uh, um, always share the information and try to create the community from people all over the world to do great things uh, from being, bringing a shell sculpture to Burning Man to <laughs> bringing a pavilion at the Biennale. Um, and we have the network and, and the knowledge to do that. So um, thank you very much. I'm always open. Um, hope yeah. to see you in Thank Venice. you for being here for a second. Yeah, I'm just going to answer one question that we have. There are people wondering about the residencies. So uh, I just shared it on the chat. Uh, there are three famous residencies in Venice. So we have uh, Bevilacqua. We have a course at European Cultural Academy uh, at two week where you work on, on your art project. And there is also Fondazione Cini that offers res residences for the artists. So check this uh, out. Is there going to be another Zoom meeting before the beginning of summer? Um, I don't know. We haven't decided that yet. Uh, there might be. So follow us on Instagram, subscribe to our newsletter, subscribe to Alexis' newsletter uh, and, and, and to her website uh, to, to see the news and uh, updates. Maria just shared her contact details. Um, Alexis. Yes, I was going to say, um, I'm so looking forward to um, this immersion. So being able to, what I, what I often find missing is it's either what we always say when, when we're working with artists on growing their businesses is that artists are just hardwired to run the best businesses in the world because the intuitive part, the creative ability is already there. It's very, it's a very creative act to run a business constantly. It's at things are changing on a daily basis. Every artist has that tough skin to do that already. And that it's like a built-in quality that so many business people are lacking. But the part that's missing is that you can't just run a business on instinct. 
you have to have some structure and strategy in place so that you can flow within that with your with your intuition. And so that is the the gap that always needs bridged. And so with this immersion, it's it's a combination of both. It's like the perfect combination of both because you're immersed in this art, you're immersed in the Biennale, and you're immersed in ideation for 10 days combined with helping you create that structure and strategy that you need to create a foundation for the business you want to create that's unique to you. So that is the, that for me is just the deciding factor. Um, so I'm very excited about that. Yeah. Hard to find that. Great. Finding time, very important. Finding time for yourself, for art projects. That's very, very important. Um, and time is a resource that it's so scarce that, uh, you know, being able to dedicate some time to yourself for you, I think it's really crucial for your success. All right. Thank you very yeah. much. Oh, uh, oh Alex, yeah. I just have a last word, if I may. My yes. personal philosophy is that we are defined by what we do. So in other words, people say, I'm a, you know, I'm a kind person. Are you? What have you done that's kind? People say, I'm a creative person. Really? What have you done that's creative? Oh, well, I haven't had the opportunities or I haven't had the time, blah, blah, blah. Well, you just got to uh, do things. And, uh, you know, that's... Um, there's a million reasons not to do things. There's sort of one good reason to do it. So it's it's better to act and uh, change or vary or respond along the way, but but get moving. That's my that's my last word. <laughs> Thank you. I think it's a perfect um, ending. Um, very inspiring. I see a lot of comments saying that we, uh, you know, the guys are inspired by the conversation. Thank you very much. Yes, we will send, if you've registered for the webinar, we will send the recording uh, to you. We put it on YouTube and we share the YouTube uh, link um, with um, everyone. Thank you for this fruitful meeting. Great. All right. I wish um, everyone um, a good continuation of the day. Uh, grazie mille, arrivederci e ci vediamo a Venezia. Grazie. Bye. Ci vediamo a Venezia. Ciao. Ciao. Buonasera. Ciao. Ciao.